Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Unbelievers. My name is Cams, The Unbeliever, and I'm here with... Badge, also an unbeliever. Unbelievably. Excellent. And how are you this evening, Barge? Um, yeah, all right. I mean, um, I got a kind of mountain to climb, but I'm all right. <laughs> a three book mountain, you mean, in one volume? Uh, well, even even this little two chapter kind of oh. uh, section, yeah. Right. Yeah, so we're covering s- chapters six and seven, and before we go any further. I'm just going to make the listeners aware that there is a scene of violation in one of these chapters. So if that's something that you would rather not listen to, then you can look away now and come back for the next one. But if you're reading along, you're going to have to kind of get to it anyway. So, you know, it might be interesting to hear what our take is on it. So stick around. I just thought I would let you know that there is a scene in it that's potentially triggering so look out for that at the end of chapter 7 uh, it's certainly shocking it yeah. is quite shocking yeah it's yeah I mean as, as a, a newbie to the whole thing yeah yeah totally kind of yeah it rocked me in my perception of TC but we'll come to that we will we will hmm. yeah so before we get to that we start out where we left off at the end of chapter 5 in Mythel Stone Down with Ati Aaron and uh, Trell, Lena's mother and father, and dusk is deepening over the valley. Yeah, so it's a, just a nice kind of image, I think, you know. Uh, the father is seeing, you know, this big, this big guy uh, who works with stone, almost like a magician, and he's singing or, you know, this incantation. And, and it is, does seem to be magic because various things happen. Um, uh, I liked, I really like the, uh, the pace of conversation and the way uh, they talk and address each other. I mean, it's, um, yeah, very measured. Yeah, there's a at the beginning when we're introduced to Atty Aaron, she's referred to as Atty Aaron, my mother, and I thought, is this just exposition? But it's actually not. They talk that way all the time. So Trail's known as, or he's just Trail, I think, but Atty Aaron is known as Trail Mate. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, they, they refer yeah, to each other quite formally, even within the family setting. Uh, right, and also, I mean, the way in which the father-daughter conversation takes place in terms of uh, light admonishment or kind of, you know, uh, indulgence, it's it's also along those lines. I mean, it's, it's almost... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I had that impression later on that it's... You know, I don't know, uh, uh, kind of the interaction that takes place maybe in uh, between kings and queens in fairy tales, that kind of uh, speech. Anyway. Yeah, there's a nice <laughs> moment where I think Trail's washing the dishes and Lena wants to go off to the gathering, the circle of elders. And the mother's like, you know, you can almost imagine her wagging her finger and Trail's like, yeah, on you go. And she runs up to him and gives him a big hug. Yeah, yeah, because um, yeah, uh, the the bowl had been broken. And that was an interesting thing, actually. And, I mean, it, uh, it kind of adds to the impression that this is a, a place of healing and things being kind of put together, huh? Um, how he takes it, the father takes it upon himself to fix this stone bowl that had been dropped when uh, Lena uh, hears the terrible message that uh, uh, TC had brought, kind of thing, I think. And um, and then he fixes it. He, he heals the bowl, but it takes a lot out of him. He says he can't do this every day. Yeah, he does, he does. It's when TC announces the return of the Grey Slayer, and she, drop, she drops the bowl... 
And it reminds me of there's a, if you'd call it a philosophy, a sort of Eastern idea of, I think it's called Ikigai, which is where you repair things rather than discard them. And where pottery and stoneware is concerned, you repair it with gold. So you melt the gold and put it into the cracks and put it all back together again. And the idea is that you create something even more beautiful than it was originally by repairing it in such a way. Uh, well, there's a, a nice um, metaphor buried in that, mm. indeed. But when, when Trail fixes the bowl, there are no visible cracks or anything. It's all whole. Yeah. Uh, there's also um, a little bit where uh, he's asked, Thomas Covenant is asked by Trell whether he has another name. And that's when he comes out with it. He calls uh, himself a, the Unbeliever. That's it? Yeah. 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 Thomas Covenant, he said, as if he were uh, rising to a challenge, the Unbeliever. Aye. Um, so, yeah, there it is. Right, so uh, uh, he's in this place. He's kind of being made welcome. Uh, he's getting a lot of attention from Lena. Um, and um, the mother then uh, begins to kind of ask him some question so she begins to kind of home in and zoom in on on like the reason for his presence right because she has some kind of foreboding or some kind of sense because uh, she says that his need needs to be attended to uh, you seem to bear a need that should not wait she gets a sense of that just from his presence yeah which is actually true he has the need to deliver his message. Uh, right. And, um, I mean, he's, he's still kind of floating through this, this space where he's back and forth. Uh, I mean, although that comes in a little bit more later uh, between, you know, am I in a dream and, uh, you know, getting through that. Um, but, but here he, he seems to be kind of, all right, uh, until until uh, he has this conversation with with the mother, right? And she she begins to give him some she some sense that that she knows a little bit more about what's happening to him than he knows himself. Yeah, she looks at his hands. She asks to see his hands, and Covenant remembers Lena's initial reaction. He holds up his right hand and Atiaran is shocked. And she talks of Beric, her Beric half hand, earth friend, hearth you and Lord Fatherer. The legend is that he will return to the land when there is need. Do you know these things? And Covenant replies gruffly, No. Mm. And then she asks to look at his other hand. Mm. And that's when she sees yep. the ring. Yeah. So this is quite a, an important scene. And he remembers his wedding. He thinks of Joan. He thinks of the beggar who told him to be true. And then he announces that it's white gold. And Atty Aaron reacts very strongly to that. And she's the only one in the village who has knowledge of the white gold. And he says, what's the matter with you? It's only a ring. But she says it's white gold. As forlorn as if she had just suffered a bereavement. And then she sings him the song. Yeah. About the white, wild, magic gold is a paradox. Yeah. And then we have line after line of paradox. Well, that seems to be the, the thing which also... Uh, yeah, so it's it's not at all clear, like, you know, I mean, that it's going to go one way or the other. Everything seems to be possible, and therein maybe lies the danger that it's it's so unstable, and it could it could 
just go one way or the other to either extreme. Yeah. So it's something that comes from elsewhere, outside of the land. It's been brought in. Yeah, and it's this white gold, because white gold has never been found in the land. That's right. And he remembers back to what Lord Fowle said to him. Wild magic, you will never know what it is. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so he's he's getting a sense that there's there's a lot of stuff going on and he's got some connection with it. He still hasn't heard the legend of Beric Halfhand, um, uh, but, but clearly... Uh, you know he's he's getting attention from the residents of this land as if he were uh, very carfand. Yeah, and there's or a scene. Something along those lines. There's a scene on for me, page sixty six, where he gets a, a feeling of his own importance when he's having a discussion with Lena, and she says, "I must not fail to offer you refreshment while you wash or bathe." And then it says that uh, people like Trell and Lena were prepared to take him as seriously as he wanted. All he had to do was keep moving, follow the path of his dream to Revelstone, whatever that was. He felt giddy at the prospect. On the impetus of the moment, he determined to participate in his own importance, enjoy it while it lasted. Right. So remember that he's come from, however long it was, a year or longer of... Suffering, of surviving, of having to live according to a strict regime, of being shunned, of not yeah. even being able to go into his own village without people running away from him and pointing at him. And all of a sudden, he's now someone. Right. And it says, to cover his rush of new emotions, he told Lena that he would like to wash, so... He's trying to just understand, and he, I think he's beginning to enjoy this feeling of importance that's been that's not been in his life for such a long time. He's had no human connection for such a long time, right? And now he's in he's in the village, and he's he's been treated reverently. Yeah. Um, however, I mean. There's there's always the presence of of this other side to it, yeah. which which never goes away. Um, so the mother goes off to sing to the gathering, right? Um, is that about the stage where we're at? No, they have at, dinner first. They have a I see, together. right, right, right. And he he enjoys the food. They all sit together around the table with the the room being lit by the graveling, which doesn't flicker. It's solid light coming from the graveling, which is, I imagine it to be like round stone pellets inside these receptacles. And there's a scene where we get an idea of how he's beginning to love the land, where it starts with uh, something in his expression made Covenant feel that he came from a very poor world, where no one knew or cared about healing stoneware pots. <laughs> he tried to tell himself that he was dreaming, but he did not want to listen. Hmm. Yeah, certainly getting a sense that this is uh, a place where healing is, is possible. Mm. Um, and that that contrasts greatly with, with um, the other life where he had to accept uh, that hope was an illusion. Yeah, and he's getting to enjoy status, he's getting to enjoy respect, human connection, and a meal, a bountiful meal, with cold salt beef covered in steaming gravy, wild rice, dried apples, brown bread and cheese, and spring wine. So they make it sound very appetising. And interestingly, it's, it's all food that we have in our world as well, apart perhaps from the spring wine and the Aliantha, of course. 
Also, there was a description of the moon rising uh, later on, which made me think that, that that sounds like it's in this world as well. Yeah. But there's a portent of doom to come when they're sitting at the meal. They ate slowly and a pall hung over them. They dined as deliberately as if this meal marked the end of all their happiness together. That's quite foreboding. And there's a scene where the 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 parents, Lena's parents, tell her that she was born in evil times. So they know that this is a, a crossroads of some sort. Whether he saves the earth or damns it, as it says in the, the Paradox song. Yeah, he will save or damn the earth because he is mad and sane. So something's about to change. And then we get a discussion of the difference between the stone lore and the wood lore. So those who are involved in the wood lore, the the Lily Anril, they live in a wood helven called Soaring Wood Helven. And Trail and Atiaran live in a stone down. And it says that they do trade with one another, but they don't trade wood or stone. So there's no wood in Mythal Stone Down and Covenant comments on that. Yep. And that's when he gets a, an explanation of the Stone Down and the Wood Helven. And it mentions the Oath of Peace during that discussion. But it doesn't explain what it is. And then it talks of the exile of the people. So yeah, that got me wondering. I'd forgotten about that and I'm curious about where they went. So after the ritual of desecration, in the period which they call the desolation, they were exiled and didn't return for many years. And that was when they lost the wood lore. And I guess the wood helven inhabitants lost the stone lore. So in a sense they became divided in some way. And it doesn't say really how long they were away, but I imagine it was a long, long time for that to have happened. Hmm. Okay, and that's when Ati Aaron goes off to sing. Right, yeah. And um, basically to tell of of the legend of um, Mr. Halfhand. Yes. And it's it's another typical Thomas Covenant info dump. We've got page after page of some history of the land. But I mean, in general terms, it's it's talking about an almost mythological time where where there was unity and that unity then split. And the description of, of the split is is the king uh who who becomes corrupted by the lust for power. Yeah, and it says that that corruption comes in the form of a cloud. Didn't the cloud didn't that come later and shift the balance of the battle? Yeah, it does. It does. As the battle raged, a shadow, a grey cloud from the east fell over the hosts. And it turned his sword. Mm. So it made a difference. Um, but the king had already somehow succumbed to uh, whatever, that corruption. Right, the lust for power and control and and things. And then after the coming of the cloud, then even those that had resisted before became corrupted. Yeah, yeah. Until only Beric is left. Yeah. So he's he was a formidable person in in this mythological time. Uh, strength to take on any king and, you know, stood with the queen who wanted peace and and love, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it says here, after a time a shadow came over the heart of the king. He tasted the power of life and death over those who served him and learned to desire it. That's it. So it's a shadow, it's not a cloud. Oh, I see. I see. That's what you mean. Right, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Because for me, the the cloud is the same cloud, perhaps, as the cloud that was seen by Lena on uh, Kevin's watch. Yeah. 
and there's a reference later on, I think, to a cloud. Um, so, yeah, right, right. Yeah. And before that, before the king has the shadow over his heart, we get some other races introduced. So it mentions the old lords, which we've learned of before. It mentions the giants again. That's the second time we've heard of the giants. Uh, there's the Oath of Peace is mentioned again before the desolation. And then it mentions the Viles who sired the Demondim. Oh, yeah. Uh, who at that time, though, in this mythological past, were good guys and, you know, made nice kind of yeah. stuff out of metal. They were a high and lofty race. Hmm. And the Cave Whites, it's the Cave Whites who were the, the metal workers. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know. I did check this to make sure I wasn't speaking out of turn. But uh, Drool Rockworm is a cave white. And he is referred to as a cave white in the earlier chapters. So, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't giving something away. So, I checked. Hmm. And it is referred. He's referred to as a cave white. Okay. He's the I one that, that calls so. covenant with the staff. Sounds relevant, yeah. Just to get an idea of the different mm. races of yeah. inhabitants in the land. Right, and, and also the sense of the time. Because mm. this was the time of the king and queen or whatever was before even the old lords. Yes. So that's when he goes back to, huh? So the 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 earliest of times or the earliest of whatever recorded history. It's like, you know, peace throughout the land. It's that old kind of trope. And then something happens and it all gets destroyed. And uh, we start again, right. but with, with everyone divided into different factions. Um, if you've come across uh, um, Campbell and the power of myth, Joseph Campbell and the power of myth... Yeah, uh, yeah. He talks exactly about that, and and the hero's journey, exactly. which is a fundamental thing, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're absolutely right. Uh, but interestingly enough, I mean, I don't know. I was thinking about this, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, the going away, perhaps, and the exile is is in not necessarily just a physical one, but one of you know different dimensions over here. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but I mean, there are those kind of patterns and, and you know, um, he's certainly drawing on, well, uh, and that's genuine. I mean, all peoples, all peoples draw on mythology. Yeah. Folklore. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So this guy from antiquity then, um, and these, these, these people think he's come back or, um, there are signs that maybe he has, but, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, there are two things. There's the fact of his having lost two fingers, and there's the white gold. So to have one thing come true would be a sign, but to have two? You know, it mm. seems if, if you're a, an inhabitant of the land, mm. then, you know, how else are you going to think of it? And from TC's point of view, with his growing understanding of maybe a little bit of um, what the hell may be going on, there's also then the memory of what uh, 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 Bain, Lord Bain, said to him. Lord Fowl. Uh, Lord Fowl, yeah, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I'm not quite sure what a Bain is, you see, so, yeah, anyway... So. It's like, you know, Clover, the basset hound, is the bane of my life because I always have to clean the kitchen up every morning. Oh, is it used in that sense? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I see. All right, OK. okay. So we don't know. Okay. I suppose it's referring to TC as being Lord Phil's bane. Uh, right, OK. I get you. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Right, you. Just sorry to get a wee reference to Clover, the basset hound in there. Hmm? <laughs> hmm. But then she's not. Huh? She's no, not she's adorable. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> we, met, we met another two Bassets today when we were out on the, the sports field. 
And the woman was like, oh, how long have you lived here? I said, oh, I don't know, 15 years. She said, I've never seen you. I'd never seen her either. So we had yeah, right. we had a wee Bassett party this yeah, afternoon. Right, it was right, fun. Right. I mean, yeah, ships in the night for 15 years and then <laughs> boom. Okay, right, cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a wee bit I want to refer to here just on the last page of chapter 7 when... Berek stood upon the rock and beheld his enemies close upon him. He took the pledge, sealing it with the blood of his riven hand. The earth replied with thunder. From the heights of the mountain came great stone fire lines, devouring everything in their path. The king and all his host were laid waste, and Berek stood above the rampage on his boulder like a tall ship in the sea. So it's at the moment where... There's no, there's no chance he can win, and then he calls these lions down by pledging an oath to the land. Yeah, so this is this is then at the point where uh, the clouds, the dark cloud has come, changed the course of the battle, and he's he's had to flee, and then he kind of gives up, and then then the rock says, and I I really like what the rock says actually, because the rock says. Yeah, you can find a friend. And he says, well, who are, you guys aren't my friends because these guys are still pursuing me and uh, the rocks aren't caving in on them kind of thing. And then the rock says, hang on, they're also living beings. They have, they have uh, entitlement to walk the earth. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. Like you know, that's preserving the neutrality, right? I, 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 I like that. Anyway, but. You can still find your friend if you pledge uh, your oath, whatever it is, your oath to yeah. the, uh, what's it, the healing of something, right? So he has to pledge himself completely to the healing of something. Yes, yeah, there is a friend for you in the earth if you will pledge your soul to its healing. Right, there you go, right. So to healing the right. land, the earth. Does it pledge mm. the soul to your soul's healing or to the earth's healing? Mm. Well, it's not clear. Yeah, and right, and we'll we'll see just how kind of uh, true he might have been to anything like that, huh? Mm. <laughs> uh, so I mean, it's 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 not clear, of course, whether he actually is uh, a half hand. I mean, no. there's a there's a lot of indication that maybe and this and that, uh, and uh, the thing is that uh, from what uh, the mother says, sorry, I forget her name, Atiaran. Atiaran. So it seems as if uh, the person with well, uh, with the hand and the white gold might be the very last. So, the last of all the resistance against what's coming, right? And therefore his presence is so alarming. Yeah, but... Even if there's the ambiguity of, of, you know, where it could go, like the paradox. When the bowl gets dropped, when Lena drops the bowl, it's because Covenant's just dropped the news that the Grey Slayer has returned... So up until that point, ah, the yes, land yes, wasn't yes, under yes. any threat, or at least yeah, they didn't right. know. Yeah, okay, okay. So what, what are they looking for a redeemer for? Right, okay, so okay, so I'm understanding the, the, the hierarchy of events then a bit better. So it's the appearance of the great cloud that is the loudest kind of alarm bell. But then um, there's, there is something about um, Beric Halfhand appearing at the very end. Uh, maybe I'm just misremembering. Okay. And then uh, along with this grey cloud, then there's also the possibility of Beric Halfhand himself having reappeared with the possibility of winning, or at least repelling uh, the danger. I think that 
the coming of Beric Halfhand signals that there is a danger, that the land is under threat, and they didn't know that before. So they they see him. That's why he's a paradox. Because yeah, right. he can save yeah. or he can uh, damn the earth. Because before he arrived, they were just getting on with their lives without any awareness of danger. And when he appears, it's like, uh oh. <laughs> If he's going to be a redeemer, there must be something coming that we'll need redemption from. Hmm. And then, like Beric, you know, it was right at the last minute that he made his oath and was able to defeat the host. Yeah. So that's why when they're having their meal, it says that they they felt that it was the last the last moment of all their happiness together. Because now covenants come, it's like this This signifies something serious. And earlier on they said, Alas, Lena, my daughter, you were born into an evil time, and there will be no peace or comfort for you when the battle comes. Ah, Lena, Lena. So it's, it's a very informative chapter. It gives us a lot of information and things to think about. And not just us, it gives covenant. A lot of things to think about as well. And he does. He thinks about them and he gets a bit freaked out. That's when we get into chapter 7. Hmm. And he feels the need to escape. It's all been too much for him. And Lena, she's perceptive. She gets an idea of what's going through his mind. And she doesn't, she doesn't give him any platitudes. She sees the state that he's in and she says, I know... A place I could take you where you could be alone, and they head off together. Yeah, uh, he's he's really kind of at this point saying, "I I hate to be put in this uh, situation where I'm I'm expected to be this uh, uh, redeemer, this savior type guy. I can't do it. I'm a leper. I'm an outcast. Like, uh, what the hell's going on?" So I mean, he's he's kind of freaking out at the notion of, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, the responsibility for uh, saving the world. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, he, yeah. So he he just wants a bit of yeah. He wants to go and and um, spend some time by himself. But uh, Lena uh, says she can find him somewhere where he can be by himself. And it seems quite a long way for them to go, uh, but they do. Yeah. Um, um, she's been so uh, in my opinion she's never very clearly in any way led him on no um, there's been there have been a couple of times where you know like he's caught her eye and and then you know looked away in embarrassment and it seemed to him as if you know uh, and then there's all also all it's the uh the the respect and the the curiosity about him you know this this um this innocent open curiosity to wanting to know about him and uh looking up to him and all these new feelings and and right so he's and then he's really agitated and he's he's over there and um they have a, a little interaction that's right he gets to the stage where he he's wondering about whether he's in a dream and he he states that this is this is a nightmare mm. am i going too far ahead no i'd, I'd like to come back to Near the beginning of the chapter when he, he tells Lena that he can't go on. What's happening to me? And she asks if he's well and he lashes out. He says, no, I'm not well. Nothing's well. And that's when he mentions his divorce. Oh, yes. He's not, nothing's mm. been well since since I was divorced. And then he glared at her, defying her to ask what a divorce was. And later on, she asks him, he says, okay, ask me. Because she's got questions and she's she's let him know that she's curious about him. And he says, ask me. And she says, are you married? And that's the first question she asks him. And he doesn't take that well. 
Yeah. So I guess she doesn't know what divorce means. And we do get an explanation of what marriage, the marriage ritual in the stone down. Right. Lena discusses yeah. that there's a boy in the village that has been making a play at her, trying to woo her. Treok, his name is. And she's not sure. She's kind of, you know, I don't know if I want to marry this guy. And then Covenant asks what the marriage ritual's like in the stone down. And she, she recites it all word for word, all the vows that are said and mm -hmm. what it means. I mean, she says she doesn't want to uh, marry this guy because uh, she, she's got, I don't know, a bigger ambition. She wants to go to the uh, lower... Uh, whatever the lower university and yeah. basically go through it, whatever it takes, and yeah. become a lord. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, and basically his his yeah his world is too kind of small. And even here, you see, there's again that ambiguity that you know uh, I don't know. Um, like, is she saying this with any meaning? Right? Is she saying it pointedly? And I think she's not. It's uh, she's very clearly not. It's an it's it's a statement in response to what the conversation is, right? Yeah, you mean she's not she's not letting them know that she's available. That, that what you're uh, exactly right, right. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. So what's going on in Thomas Covenant's head at this moment? And you know, like you know, what kind of things is he anyway? Uh, um, I'm just kind of uh, trying to. A picture the development of of his uh, psychological state, yeah. right? Because, um, yeah, what happens next, I didn't expect. Yeah, and I mean, knowing what's coming, it means that I was able to read the preceding chapters with that in mind, and it's telegraphed quite strongly throughout the first few chapters when you know what's coming. So, Mithel Stone down the chapter when it discusses the way the soft fabric of her shift hung on her breasts and hips, her slim waist, the sight of her made the tingling in his palms grow stronger. Um, right. So, I mean, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's what I picked up as infatuation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so far what we can understand about Thomas Covenant is that he is, he has, he's sensitive. True, yeah. That's he's sensitive, yeah. and he's not. Uh, I mean, although there's there's that anger that's that's present, he has a lot of willpower, a lot of self discipline. I mean, to do his exercises, to have gone at it for so long. Uh, yeah. So I mean, right. I mean, clearly he's he's aware of her in a sexual way and uh, he maybe can't express that to himself uh, he feels from him his side chemistry and you're right I mean there it, it's it's there right throughout you see it yeah. um, and and it's never clear that she sees anything of that in the same way that he does and it's never clear that she responds in a similar way, right? Everything is kind of very vague and, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, yeah, just just wishful thinking. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, if, if two and two are added up. The awe, the reverence that she has, you see, for someone starved of attention... You know, that could then take crazy forms of what it might be yeah. uh, in a head. So, I mean... Mm. We go back to the third page when he's going to the to pay his bill at the, the telephone company and he walks past several high school girls pricing cheap jewellery. They leaned on the counters in prov provocative poses Covenant's throat tightened involuntarily. He found himself resenting the hips and breasts of the girls, curves for other men's mm. caresses, not his. He was impotent. Right, yeah, the impotence. Yeah, so imagine goodness. what that must be like, not, I mean, still having desires, but knowing that you'll never be able to satisfy them, and then becoming resentful 
I can understand. I mean, obviously, I'm not that way myself, but it's. I think that section there in in chapter one and page three of chapter one, right at the beginning, it gives us an idea of mm. how painful sexual impotence must be, and how f- frustrating and. But um, sure. I mean, sure. I'm not. Of course, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not uh, condoning or, you know, any of that. But, I mean, yeah, right. But, I mean, uh, if one... I mean, just to to look at the other side of the possible experience of uh, one's desires and not being able to do anything about that, and that is to uh, potentially deal with them in the way that that many uh, uh, monks, nuns, and things like that have dealt with, right? Yeah. I mean... Uh, effectively to transform it into something else. Yeah. And perhaps that's what he was doing up until he was transported to the land where he was just going through the survival rituals and he was it was becoming anger and uh, discipline. Mm. Who knows? But then, I mean, if you think about it, maybe those girls were the first, uh, as it were, attractive and... Um, you know, uh, just cannot be had beyond kind of uh, thing, uh, stimulus that he had had in the other world. Yeah. Um, and he certainly reacted to it. So, um, yeah, I don't know that he'd dealt with it at all. No, probably not. Perhaps he just avoided any situations. Exactly. Uh, I mean, and yeah, who would anyway uh, asleep with a leper? Yeah, yeah. Because it does say that even the release of lust was denied to him. He could conjure up desires until insanity threatened, but he could do nothing about them. Yeah, so um, anyway, so here he's then, right, feeling... uh, that things are changing, that, you know, even the impotence can can potentially be healed. And uh, uh, and then there are so many other kind of big things going about his expe- what is maybe being expected of him. Uh, he wants to get away. She's there with him. Uh, he has another impulse to hit her. Yeah. He does hit her. And then he does hit yeah, her. Yeah, he does. When... Uh, isn't that at the point where he says uh, that he's living through a nightmare and this place is a nightmare? And she says, no, it's not. It's not a nightmare. Yeah, he says to her, are you trying to drive me crazy? Lena flared with sudden courage. I do not believe it. It may be mm. that your world, but the land, ah, the land is real. Right. And that's when he reacts. Yeah, you're right. He says this is a nightmare. And she says, no, it's real. Yeah, and then um, then Thomas, then Covenant whirled and struck her a stinging, a stinging slap across the face. Like just, you know, after saying, are you trying to drive me crazy? And after, and then, you know, she gets startled by the tone. And then he goes to the next level and slaps her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult scene. I've actually not really been looking forward to talking about this, but it's mm. it's a scene in the book that I know I've seen many people put the book down after this chapter, mm. which, you know, I can understand. Uh, his face contorted in a wild grin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, um... She felt that he was going to kill her. Yeah, that's what it says. And she stood dumb and helpless. Um, she's also innocent, so I mean, you know, she wouldn't even. It wouldn't even occur to her, maybe, that he was trying to rape her if if she hadn't been looking at him, you know, um, and wasn't even maybe aware of the eyes that he was. Uh, looking at her with on occasion. Well, no, it's like we discussed last week with the idea of raising a stick to a dog. 
Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and so, you know, as you've said, there's no indication that she's leading him on in any way. And he's seeing all these signals. And that's being explained to us at different parts of the story. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there's, there's nothing else to it. He, he rips her clothes off and, and he rapes her. Yeah. And um, she doesn't resist. Uh, she feels helpless. Her limbs can't move. Um, and this. Uh, but even as she cried out, she knew that it was too late for her. Yeah. Something that her people thought of as a gift had been torn from her. Yeah. It's brutal. A brutal. And he didn't feel like a taker. I mean. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so he... Yeah. Um, so what's... What is going on? Yeah, I've... Got trouble talking about it. Actually, I'm I'm not finding this very easy. Okay, it's so like, I'll give you. Yeah, you've right. got another nine plus three quarters of a book left with this guy. You know what I mean? And you, that's why people put the book down. It's like I don't want to. I don't want to stick around with this guy's a hero. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <coughs> but knowing mm. what I know. Mm. I can't really say anything, so I'll just leave it there. But. Yeah. But, I mean, at the very least, it must make his own task all the, all the harder. I mean, um, there's a side of him that has sensitivity, and once he comes back to uh, a different level of awareness that is above the, the state that he's in when he rapes her, yeah. then, I mean... You know, I mean, I did have the sense that this, for the first time, he acts diseased in a diseased way. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no two ways to it in my sense. At the moment, from here, I can't imagine... Uh, I can't picture <laughs> anything he might do, any any movement of the storyline that could justify it. No. Or uh, that could negate it, uh, in a sense. There's no redemption. And I, I'm not being... Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Exactly. It's irredeemable, I mean, yeah. In a sense, the violation, uh, what was taken away from her, can never be returned. Yes, Absolutely. And that that beautiful innocence of self that was so beautifully expressed. Uh, I mean, yeah, who knows how that that. So that the 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 cracking of that. I mean, her father can't fix it like he did the cup. No, 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 no. Uh, and so I mean that that was a, the, the the real shocker, like you know, and the, as you say, so early on. I know, like so early on, and it's he's already there's already this this much like set up the, this massive amount into climb and now it's like exponentially bigger I, I think well it's it's not the story that you thought you were going into it, mm. it all changes mm -hmm. and mm. I think the author must have I mean obviously he knew that this was coming he, he must have wondered how much time to put in before it happened and decided not much uh, well you know yeah right and if if this is, as it were, uh, one of those doorways, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm walking through because I mean, this is this is part of the story, right? And I mean, it's it's not a uh, it's not a question of taking a um, uh, a moral position because the the position is is self evident. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. You know, they just just have to talk about what was there, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. This is why in the the first episode. We discussed, or at least I brought up the idea of, of Nietzsche and immorality and whether if one were to act 
outside of the bounds of morality, inside a dream. If one did not believe that one's situation were real, then maybe he felt he could get away with it because there are no consequences. Uh I think that's an aspect, definitely an aspect, because it was it was the whole is this a dream or a nightmare thing that triggered the slap, and then you know, uh, and and he also had the thought earlier on that well, you know, I've got to push forward. Uh, he says something interesting, which I don't know, I thought might uh, uh, kind of mean something to you too. Uh, Madness was the only danger. He says that on page 72 uh, in my thing on the previous chapter. Um, um, he says his fingers re- uh, uh, twitched with violence, but he drew cool air deep into his lungs, put everything behind him. He knew how to survive a dream. Madness was the only danger. Mm. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And and so, uh, for me, uh, this step of allowing his lust to embody this uh, violation of Lena um, is a very big leap towards madness. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, because I mean, even in in the dream. I mean, I I don't really think there's a difference. I mean, and after all, one cannot uh, unequivocally say when one is in the dream state that this waking state is not the dream and the other way around. Uh, So, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, in a dream, perhaps that that could be a a lesson being taught. Mm. But, uh, yeah, perhaps, I mean... You know, there's, there's that. Um, uh, that does add an interesting dimension to it, you know. Then if it was a dream, what? Is is it is it less of a thing that he raped Lena? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, uh, right. Does so, that I absolve mean, him of responsibility, yeah. as it would do if he were mad? In a sense, in a legal sense, perhaps. Yeah, but then that's... I think that that's a load of bullshit anyway, because, I mean... You know, law is 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 technical. All right, in a moral sense, then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it certainly it colours the rest of the story, as as you would expect, and it's it's whether you have the the desire to continue with it after this moment or not. Oh, in general, you mean mm. whether one has? I mean, I'm. I'm up for it. It, is, it doesn't... I mean, now that we've talked about it, you know, I was also not looking forward particularly to, to talking about it and, like, how are we going to tackle it and, and, and things. And, and, I mean, I gave it a few thoughts and then just, you know, I think we've done a, a decent enough job. I hope um, so. Yeah, I hope so. You know? Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, the consequences. I mean, I was thinking then, yeah, how is he going to show his face to his hosts, like, you know? I know. And, uh, like, how's that going to poison his endeavours to kind of be uh, be the hero? And, and, like, yeah. And, like, poor we Lena, what's going to kind of become of her, like, now, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, because, you know, that is that happy, carefree, innocent nature, like, yeah. Mm. And, uh, I mean, um, Stephen Donaldson seems to be dealing with all these subjects with, with a lot of subtlety, so it'll be interesting to see how, uh, how it all develops and how it all kind of fits together and, you know, what the, the ties of, of cause and effect, yeah, you know, yeah, whether, yeah. whether dream or real and, you know, the, the back and forth and, and all that, how, how that develops. So, yeah, I mean, I was shocked, but I'm not put off. Good. I'm, I'm kind of glad that it's passed now because I've been, I mean, obviously it looms large 
when you mm. know it's coming and it's like I just want this out of the way so we can get on with the story yeah right, right. Um, you know yeah. now that I mean we know that this is going to have consequences that are going to reverberate throughout the rest of it um but yeah and how. yeah and I remember you telling me um right at the very start when when you were uh, when we were just even talking about this uh podcast you were saying that there's there's a point and you'll know when it comes yes and I knew when it came yeah right. yeah uh and I had some kind of inkling well maybe I don't know you know uh if something happens between them, then, you know, that kind of, like, uh, shady grey area of, of underage liaison things. But no, this is like a, a smash. It's yeah. Like smash. So, it's, yeah, you, mm. you mentioned subtlety on the part of the author right up until the juggernaut hits you. <laughs> Yo, right, right, mm. right. But, yeah, I guess that's, yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's certainly skilled writing. I have to say, like, really enjoying the the flow and use of language and, and the descriptions. Good, good. Right, so we're moving on to chapter eight for the next time, which is ninety two hundred and two. That's twenty two pages, and then chapter nine, Jahannam, takes us up to. 141. So you're up for reading 40 pages? 9303, 13, 23, 33. Almost 50 pages. Oh. Or do you want to just do a chapter? Just do a chapter. Okay. Uh, Jahannam, is that not uh, the Arabic word for heaven? <laughs> oh, there's, yes, there are characters right, coming up that we'll be able yeah. to discuss that I probably wouldn't have been able to discuss with anyone else. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, let's let's just do one then okay, and, and see okay. how we tackle along. Uh, yeah. yeah, cool, man. Excellent. Cool, cool. Okay, well, okay. folks, sorry for the heavy one. If you've stuck with us, thank you. <laughs> uh, we've got nowhere yet that you can send us your feedback. By the time this goes out, we will have, but... We will have. As we record, we haven't, so I can't ask for your feedback just yet. Uh, but would love to uh, hear it. Yeah, we certainly would. So by the time this is up and running, we'll have links in the show notes, so you will know where to go to give us feedback, even though we don't right now. So you can do that if you, if you feel a burning desire. Uh, we'll see you for the next one. Thank you. Bye, folks. See you later. Outcast unclean. <laughs> this is Future Cams here. I've just finished the edit. It's quite hard to listen to, so I just thought I'd come in and just ask if you're okay. I hope you're all doing okay after listening to that. Don't know if I am, actually. It's... It was more difficult than I expected it to be, and I did expect it to be difficult to talk about that chapter and how it ended. So, yeah, it's not a fun one, but it does, now that that's over with, then we can move forward with the story. And of course, there there will be consequences for what happened. How could there not be? I won't go into that here, obviously, but if you've stuck with me, then, you know, I thank you. It is worth sticking with. It's, it's, you know, we wouldn't be doing a podcast about these books if they were not worthy of our time. And they would not be my favourite series of fantasy books. Were they not worthy, you know? It's just that one scene, which, I mean, when I first read that, I would have been maybe 18, 17, 18, 19. Don't remember exactly when, but they're round about that age and... I don't know, maybe at that age it was easier or maybe the time that we lived in, I don't know I don't know but I got past it and I got through the books and uh, so yeah, I just wanted to to let you know how I'm feeling after doing that edit at the end of the show we did talk about how we had nowhere to post etc, well (laughs) I said I would post some links I can put in that information now because I've set it up 
we now have a URL, which is theunbelievers.co, and we will be posting uh, on Podbean. We'll be using the Podbean hosting platform. I believe if you download the Podbean app, if you're using iPhone or Android, I think, and I should check that, I don't know actually, I think you might get some more features if you listen to a Podbean hosted podcast using the Podbean app. Not sure, but I think so. We would love your feedback, and I know this was a heavy episode, so if you want to get in touch, and I mean, hopefully we've dealt with it in a, a sensitive way. You know, and I'm aware that we're two men talking about a rape scene written by a man, so... You know, I'm I'm aware of that fact and how that might come across. But I am who I am, so I can only talk from my own experience and, and morals and values. So I hope it hasn't offended anyone. And if it has, I apologise. But I didn't write the book. I'm just here talking about it and putting out some content. So anyway, back to the hosting thing. Yep, uh, theunbelievers.co. We will have a Patreon up and running, so if you would like to support the show uh, financially, that would be amazing. Obviously, we've got a lot of costs at the moment to set all of this up, so if you'd like to contribute, that would help us out a great deal. So you'll find that over at patreon.com slash theunbelievers. And if you'd like to show your support in a less tangible way, but an equally important way, if you were to go to your podcast host and give us a rating, five-star rating obviously would be the best to get the podcast moving up the charts and into people's attention. And also if you were able to leave a short review, that would help us out a great deal, especially as it's a new podcast. We've only just launched, so we need all the help we can get from, from listeners. And if you feel so inclined we would be very, very grateful. So thanks for listening to this, folks. And we will be back again with another episode next week. Oh, oh, before you go, just another wee quick announcement. I should add this on. We've set up a read-along using the Storygraph app, which is an app we really love. It's a a read-along tracking app that's run by a small independent team. And it's perfect for our needs. They have a read-along feature that allows you to set up forums, where you can have discussions and all you need to do is sign up to the Storygraph for free, uh, create an account there and then you can join the read-along. I'll put a link in the show notes and you can click that and head on over there and help us to support a small independent app. Thanks a lot. See you there.